pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I now want to welcome you, uh, Natalie, share the floor. Thank you very much, warmly welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I feel so honored to be the first one. Um, and hopefully it will be somewhat interesting and entertaining. I really tried to tailor this talk to be really specific, um, calling out like names and hospitals, because I know all of us have so much overlapping work. And really my goal for this talk is at the end, I hope that you'll see some people that we work with or hospitals that we work with. And I'd love to have a conversation afterwards and figure out how we can work together more. Um, those of you here at the beginning overheard Miles and I connected in Geneva and have had the pleasure of working together. And now we just sent him to our project in Nepal. Um, Laura Himicki and I have co-authored a few articles together. Josh and I have as well before he came to work for research. So I just think these meetings are so critical for learning what others are doing. And I can't wait to hear other people's that I'm sure will be more interesting than mine. But we'll jump into mine for today. Um, so, oops, I think that probably is not the right view. Is it showing normal or? It's still showing the slides, uh, other slides. Let's try this. I don't know how to get it out of uh, notes mode. Presenter view? No. There you go. Um, so first, I'm going to start and give a little overview of research. Um, and like I said, the title of this talk, uh, I really want to talk about our work. I feel like research's biggest role is just opening up resources um, to those on the continent and the programs and places we work. So we focus on empowering change to make impact. Um, and I'd love to discuss the partnership potential that all of you on this call might have uh, throughout the continent. Um, so we'll, I'll give a little background of research, our history, who we are and what we do. Um, and then, like I said, I wanna take a deep dive into our programs in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then talk about a few opportunities and upcoming events. Um, so for this group, you might we can probably go through this pretty quickly. Uh, but often when we meet people, they don't know what plastic and reconstructive surgery is, especially here in the U.S. People first think of cosmetics. Um, and so we always like to start with explaining to them, like, what is this issue and the global surgery need? Um, so these are all stats that will be quite familiar to this group, but uh, 5 billion people not having access to safe, timely and affordable surgical care. 17 million people dying every year from surgically preventable diseases. Um, and that means that every two seconds, somebody is dying. And that's five times the disease burden of HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria all combined, which we all know have a lot more funding. Um, so the hope is just that we can get that funding a little more equal to the burden of disease. Um, and then also, thankfully, thanks to some people on this call too, there's been a lot more around how, uh, what a great investment global surgery is. So the World Bank um, pretty recently said it was surgery is one of the most cost-effective health interventions for every dollar we invest. $10 are gained in productivity. I think, um, as we all know, a lot of surgery is helping with disability. And so that also helps an economy's productivity. Um, it's a necessary component of universal health coverage. Um, and allowing people access to safe, timely, and affordable surgery, as well as safe anesthesia care, uh, is also helps to reduce extreme poverty. So what is reconstructive surgery? Um, as we said, you know, in the West, it might be some cosmetics as well, but reconstruction it restores normal function from an accident or trauma, congenital condition, or cancer, a lot of traffic accidents. Um, we really see a high, huge burden of disease around burns um, in sub-Saharan Africa. That's due to the conditions people are living in, open cooking fires at home for women and children, 
uh, Laura Himicky and myself have written a couple papers about that with some of our colleagues in Africa. Um, it can also be congenital conditions with hands and cancer reconstruction. So this is a sweet little boy in India that we worked with. Um, and again, just saying what those links are that um, 90% of that global burden of surgical disease is in low-income countries, um, where in the U.S. we have one reconstructive surgeon for 50,000 people. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's only one reconstructive surgeon per 10 million people. So really unequal numbers with the huge burden of disease. Um, we know that at the current rate by 2030, which is coming sooner than later, there will be a global shortage of 40 million health workers, uh, which leads us to around 800 million individuals with unmet reconstructive surgical needs. So the way that we try to get at this massive gap is really focusing on training. We know that training one surgeon creates a huge ripple effect. Um, while one surgeon can treat 9,000 patients in their career, and then this statistic is from our work in Nepal, um, we've shown that it can boost the global economy by $25 million annually. We find that it's essential to teach those local surgeons to train others. And I'll go into a little bit of detail later in my talk. We just published a paper um, and created a new model showing that if one surgeon goes on to train, they have the potential to impact 400,000 patients over their lifetime, which is the only way I think that we'll get anywhere near to closing the surgical gap. I see that there's some things in the chat. I'm not actually able to see the chat. So Laura, feel free to interrupt me um, if people want to ask questions, because I'd rather not just talk straight through for the whole time. So feel free to interrupt and ask questions if there are any. Okay, okay. Um, so now I'm going to just do a quick overview of uh, what research does. So we're over 50 years old. Our roots and foundation um, are with Stanford University. We were founded by the, the chief of plastic surgery at that time in 1969. Um, at the time when we started, we were flying patients into the U.S. from Mexico. We were going and doing fly in missions in other countries. And this is actually our first ever patient um, that research worked on, Antonio from Mexico. Um, and we've really evolved over the last 50 years, uh, but that was where our roots started. And our vision is a world where safe, timely, and affordable reconstructive surgical care is accessible to all. And how we do that is through our mission to build, scale, and sustain reconstructive surgical capacity to provide life-changing care to those with the greatest need. Um, so now I just wanted to show a quick video that goes through our work, which I feel like often is easier to see than to explain, but I'll do a little bit of both. This is just like a three, four minute video. Let me know if the sounds okay. Worldwide, five bill Oops. billion people lack access to surgical care and more than 18 Sorry. A million people die each year due to surgically treatable conditions, three times more than malaria, TB, and HIV combined. Uma is a young mother from a small town in northern India. When a cooking accident left her hands severely burned, she was unable to perform everyday tasks like working or caring for her family. Calling her defective, her husband abandoned her to fend for herself. Reconstructive surgery offers hope to people like Uma, but in the developing world, that hope is simply not accessible to most. Reconstructive surgery is surgery for the unlucky. They're unlucky maybe because they have cancer or they've had a traumatic event like a burn or a road traffic accident, or they were born with a congenital condition such as cleft lip or a missing thumb. Research International is a global nonprofit working to increase access to surgical care across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Alongside local care providers, we're building a sustainable model centered in equity, inclusion, and empowerment. Research focuses on the capacity building, and research kind of supports them by providing the funding, the resources, by providing the knowledge and the skill that they need, and also 
trying to support them over a long time. Research's unique model is scaling up access to care in low-income countries. First, research finds promising early career surgeons from low-income countries who have a passion for humanitarian work. Then, our global network of top medical volunteers trains the entire surgical team in the latest techniques with a combination of virtual education and hands-on learning. Once a local surgeon is trained and their hospital qualified, they can go on to become a research surgical outreach partner and will treat an average of 9,000 patients over their lifetime. Research directly funds these partners so that they can provide 100% free care to patients like Uma. When the surgical outreach partner then becomes a trainer themselves, the cycle repeats itself, creating a ripple effect of impact for generations to come. So it's really a partnership model. Research really does an excellent job at empowering our local partners, having them lead the way, and we help support them with resources, but with them in the lead. Universal access to health is a human right. Directly investing in surgical care is an essential strategy for supporting both universal health coverage and poverty alleviation. At Research International, we believe that no person should have to suffer a treatable or preventable disability simply because of their geography or income level. Each year, research transforms the lives of thousands of patients. It's not just the numbers, but it's also the stories. A child who burned their hands when they were little and are unable to use them, and then after this life-changing surgery, they're able to write, can build their life and have a career after that. That's a transformative impact that research is having on its patients. But we can't do this alone. We need your help to make surgical care accessible to the world's most vulnerable. Together, we can give hope and change lives. All right, thank you. Um, so I always feel like the video uh, just really captures things. And again, this group all knows this work very well and is involved in it. But for some other people, they might really have a hard time conceptualizing what that is. Um, so we do our work through these three pillars, which I'll go into a lot more detail uh, when I talk about our specific work in Africa. Um, but an essential part of our work is making sure that services are free for all, so that means whether it's the trainees, um, the patients that we're serving, and the host institutions, uh, that everything is truly free of cost. Um, I did want to show this because, again, like I said, please, if you're working in any of these countries or places, uh, we're a small organization. I think partnership is critical to helping complement the work that we're all doing. Um, and our largest program is actually in Nepal and Vietnam, which I won't be talking about at all today, um, as I'll be zooming in on our programs in Africa. But I did want to make sure to share this in case you're in any other of these countries. Happy to chat more about the specific programs there, too. Um, and just a quick snapshot of our impact over a typical year. Uh, we directly pay for about 2,400 patients. Um, through the local surgeons reimbursing them, but across 18 countries and really focusing on that training and education. Um, and one of our surgical educators, I love this quote, he said, he's been a volunteer with research for about 30 years. And he said, if we're going to look back at the impact, it won't be the 100,000 operations we've done. It will be the 40 surgeons we've trained who are doing 1,000 operations every year. Again, just thinking about that multiplier effect and the impact we can have. Um, and just the massive benefit. We saw the economic benefits, the human benefit of, you know, a small child who doesn't have use of their hand or their arm, who might be out of school, their mother might have to stay back and help care for them. And just that independent hand function, life function, and being a, a active member of society. Um, so that's all the part you guys probably know about. As I know you're all in global surgery, 
But just to ground us even more, I want to do a little bit more of a deep dive into our Africa programs. So we all know the need is most acute in Africa. 93% of the population lack access to surgical care. Um, and again, that stat with only one reconstructive surgeon for every 10 million people in the population. Um, so this is a little bit of our evolution, which I've referenced. We've only been working in Africa since 1999. Again, we started more focused with being, our organization is California-based, um, more focused on Latin America, and then really building out our hub in Nepal. Um, but we started in 1999 working with Dr. Goran Jovic, who uh, many of you may know. He's a real character. He flies around a plane in Zambia, goes treats everyone around, um, and we pay for all of the patients that he treats. Um, and then in 2001, we met this wonderful surgeon in Mali, uh, Dr. Umar, who there was no reconstructive surgery program there. So we sent him to Nepal to learn, um, which is a model we've been doing over the decades in Nepal, where we have a really big program. Originally, there was no plastic surgery training there. And so we sent the uh, general surgeons to Bangladesh and came home and they built out the residency program. Um, in 2017, we really started picking up things and doing our visiting educator trips, which I'll explain a bit more. Um, and then in 2020, we launched our official partnership with COSEXA. Um, that's Professor Godfrey Maguti and our chief medical officer, Dr. Jim Chang, who's the chief of plastic surgery at Stanford. Um, and then in 2021, we really started launching our full program in Africa, all of our scholarships, um, and that's Dr. Sif Nuru. He's Tanzanian. I don't know if you know him, Laura, but he's our doctor in Atigi. He's a wonderful young man. Um, and at the time, Muhumbili didn't have their plastic surgery program set up, so we actually sent him to Uganda for a year oh. of training with Dr. Rosalino. Um, and now Muhumbili has stood up their program, so we're able to keep people in country, but we try to do things regionally. Um, and I think a really important part of our evolution is how do we go where, you know, in the 70s, 80s, we were flying in, doing a week long mission trips and camps and then flying out and really focusing now on building up the long term local uh, medical capacity for the full surgical team, including anesthesia, nursing, occupational therapy. Um, and we're really proud that our work has been highlighted for kind of being a leader, I think, in this space. And I think most of global surgery is moving in this direction. Um, but I think this first article was published in like 2016. Um, there's been a lot of growing pains, I think, in making that transition, but we definitely believe it's the right way. Um, recently, we were on this podcast with Professor Maguti talking about our partnership with COSEXA. Um, and here's an article that Josh, who I saw is on the call, he was at Cure International. Now we're very fortunate to have him at Research. Um, worked on an article for The Hill, investing in surgical systems from quick fixes to long-term sustainability. So happy to share all these links later too. Um, and then here's the good stuff where I'm hoping that maybe some this will give some people some ideas and some places we can overlap. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of our program specific to Africa, and I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive on each one. Um, so here are the specific partners. Um, so becoming a research surgical partner means that we actually reimburse them for their cases. Um, and I'm sure many of you, we've got Operation Smile on the call and Smile Train will reimburse for cleft lips, but we do the full scope of reconstructive surgery. Again, we're much smaller, and so um, we want to make sure those burn patients are being paid for, uh, hand patients, any the whole scope. Um, so here's our current list of partners that we actually will reimburse them. Some of them do actually most work for government hospitals, so the, the reimbursement fee is small, but often it will help the patient pay for their medicine, might help pay for their transport, getting back home, um, and so any of those little ancillary fees. Um, and then we have a few hospital partnerships as well um, that I wanted to call out. Again, I know a lot of us work in these same hospitals and places. If you're working any of these places, please let me know so we can better coordinate because um, we are doing more around like 
in Uganda, for instance, Dr. Rosaleno, they need help setting up an ICU unit. They're the largest burn referral center in East Africa, and they don't have an ICU. Um, and so we're trying to get some resources and helping with that. But there's just so many great areas for us to, you know, surgery is a full team sport. While we do focus on reconstructive surgery, if the hospital doesn't have an ICU, these patients aren't going to survive to get to the care for reconstructive surgery. Um, and so that's where we're doing more and more of the supporting ecosystems as well in our hospitals um, where we have those deeper partnerships. Um, and then I just wanted to go through a little bit how we work when we visit those hospitals. So we do these visiting educator trips. As we all know, surgery is hands-on. Um, I'll talk about our virtual learning a little bit later, but we still take in-person trips as well with the focus really on education. So about a month ahead of time, um, and it's really dependent on each of the hospital sites. So in Ethiopia, for instance, they have by far the most advanced plastic surgery residency program, but they're not doing microsurgery right now. And so they've asked us to focus on that. So anytime we go, um, we'll do this, this call a month ahead of time, they'll gather like the very specific like learning cases that are gonna be best. And we'll talk back and forth. Um, I think the trip we're doing in April, we're focusing on brachial plexus and nerve reconstruction. And so we'll go back and forth on that. And then when we go in person, we do lectures every morning, we'll do hospital rounds, and then as well as the surgeries themselves with the idea that by teaching in person, um, when we leave, the team should be able to do those procedures once we've left because they're the ones gonna be doing the follow-ups as well. So here you'll see some practice microsurgery. This is actually in Zimbabwe. Um, and there they're trying to build out their hand practice as well. They don't really have that expertise yet. And so we've been investing in a few of the surgeons trying to build up their hand um, skills. And then a month afterwards, the local team uh, prepares a post-trip patient follow-up call um, we have our occupational therapists on those calls as well. And it's a lot of, as you know, a surgery, if people aren't doing their uh, OT follow-up, um, it's really important and going through just those exercises and making sure everything's going well. Um, and with those eight hospitals you saw, we're building out more academic connections as well. Because as we said, research is small, but I think our biggest benefit is like opening resources and more partnerships for the places that we work. Um, so we've connected Stanford with the hospital in Zim, Hopkins with that Uganda, um, Kirdu Referral Hospital in Northwestern. We've recently made a connection with AIC Kajabi in Kenya. Um, I know they also have deep connections with Vanderbilt uh, at Kajabi Hospital too. Um, and it's just been a really nice way for like bilateral learning. Um, a lot of the U.S. institutions have opened up their grand rounds for the local teams to join, um, which are you'll see some of these pictures here. So it's just been, um, I think, a very beneficial partnerships. Um, this is like I mentioned, really each site has a different specific need in Ethiopia. They have an incredibly robust, massive residency program, incredible expert teachers, um, but they aren't doing microsurgery there yet. Um, so we donated some desk microscopes and built out their skills lab, um, showing them how to do it on an iPhone or the desk microscopes. Um, and then we'll be going back uh, in April and doing some hands-on uh surgeries and training. And they have one surgeon there who actually did his residency in Taiwan. Um, and so he's going to be the leader of this program and is based in Addis at Alert Hospital, but really like building up the nursing team and all the other skills and things that are needed uh, now that we have him there to really lead that program, um, supporting him and building it out. Um, we also partner with a nonprofit called Ohana One, who's part of the G4 Alliance. They're based in LA, uh, and they have access to these Vuzik smart glasses. So you'll see a picture down here. It's a merged reality. Um, so partnering some of our some of our surgeons. This is actually a picture of our doctor in Nepal. Um, 
but with U.S. surgeons so that on some of those trickier cases, and if people are interested in this, this is like Ohana One's main work um, is giving out the hardware and software for these. So I'd be happy to make that connection um, if anyone is interested in these glasses. Um, and now to dive into a little bit of our virtual and online learning. Um, so this is all connected to plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, here's our live lectures we do. We do a monthly lecture for COSEXA. We do a monthly lecture for CANEXA, the School of Anesthesia. Um, we do a small group with just our nurses in Uganda. And every quarter we do a case conference with Second Chance, which is a nonprofit out of Geneva, um, so that the local teams will provide cases and we'll have case conference discussions. So if anyone's interested, just reach out to me, happy to add you to those lists. And then tons and tons of online resources. Um, we do have also lectures in anesthesia, nursing and occupational therapy. Everything's available open access on our website. Um, we also have built out a curriculum for plastic surgery for COSEXA that just launched in 2023. Um, so if anyone is a COSEXA member, they can get access to that full curriculum. And we've started adding our lectures to Surge Hub, um, which is the UN open access learning website. I think we've only added a couple of our nursing lectures on there so far, um, but uh, it's been a great resource. Again, we're just trying to get all the learning material out there. Um, so here's a little more detail on the COSEXA uh, curriculum. It's 26 modules we built with the local COSEXA trainers. Um, it has cases on there, but you do need to be part of the COSEXA membership in order to access that. But we're actually, um, they've agreed that we can add those to the UN Surge Hub too, which is really great because we did help build those for them, but we'd love for it to be even more open access. Um, and then I think this is like something that I used to work at USAID and now working at a small nonprofit that I really love. Um, we have all these great virtual learning, all these free resources. And in our head, we're thinking, great, you have access to everything. And actually our partner in Uganda said, you know, our residents aren't calling in because it's too expensive, the data to call in. And so um, what we did is in these four sites, we just took a storage closet within the hospital, um, put Wi-Fi, a TV, um, a projector, and audio. And so you can kind of see a couple of them down here, um, but just making like basically like a little library in the hospital so that the residents and anyone, they don't have to be on the plastic surgery team, can go and get access to all these free resources, which I think are things that we wouldn't even think of unless we hear from our partners. You know, I would never think in my head that a free online lecture, there was still a barrier to it. Um, and so I think that's like the fun and benefit of just like listening to our partners and helping in the ways that they need. Um, another big piece of our work at Research is that we do have all of these academic connections. So our chief of plastic surgery, uh, our chief medical officer is the chief of plastics at Stanford, and we get a research fellow who comes and works with us each year. So we're really uh, lucky. Oh, that got cut off. But we have over 30 peer-reviewed articles um, that are on our website. And then Jim Chang wrote the literal textbook on global reconstructive surgery, who's our chief medical officer. Um, those books, unfortunately, are expensive. Uh, but if anyone's really interested, I can see if I can always try to get one from the editor. And then um, also our chief anesthesiologist is literally considered like the founding father of pediatric anesthesia, Dr. George Gregory, and his textbook is open access. Um, and then I kind of wanted to do a short little segue. This paper just came out and we're really excited about it. I know I've talked to Irene and Ruben about it. Um, we just wrote this paper about the lifetime impact of training because um, we realized that, you know, all of us believe instinctually training is the right way to go. It has a bigger impact, but how can we really quantify it? I think especially in medical training where, you know, you might 
in the U.S. especially be learning from like 10 different hospitals and all these different trainers? And how can you really quantify that one touch point and the different impact? And then um, the next question in that is then how can you quantify the impact over generations? Like if you have one trainer who trains a trainee and then the trainee stays at an academic setting and goes on to teach, what is that impact if they've learned from that from the first surgeon? Um, so we first looked to a few other fields to think about there must be other people who know how to do this and have quantified it. Uh, so we reached out to people in military law, um, all places where you learn uh, that have tactile learning. And really, we learned that there wasn't a standard for quantifying training impact, um, which we were pretty shocked, like even in the US Navy, in aviation, we thought there must be some way, you know, if you teach someone how to do how to fly a plane, how does the how do they think about um, their impact, but there wasn't a model. So we created one. Um, so looking at that first generation, that they might learn one procedure from many different people, the number of cases they do in a year, their years in practice. Um, and what that big fancy equation gave us is that in a low and middle income country, one surgeon who participates in training can impact over 400,000 patients through that two generations. And I would say, honestly, that was like a very conservative number too. Um, you know, we stopped it at two generations because we felt it's a little hard to take credit for that third generation. Um, so these are pretty conservative estimates that we are very excited about. Um, and again, with that model of if we go and someone sees how to do a new procedure and then they're able to do it and then they're able to teach the people around them, we really think that is the way forward. So we're super excited. That article is also open access um, so happy to send it around. Um, just two more programs I want to run through quickly, and I want to leave some time for questions. Um, we're now up to 21 annual scholarships just uh, for in the African region. So we have one annual scholarship that we um, kind of handpick that person. And then we have six scholarships that we run directly through COSEXA. Um, they're the exam scholarships so that someone is totally funded their fees travel to take the exams and then a one month regional exchange that's all managed through COSEXA. Um, and then we also have these 14 annual Matalasi Matanga scholarships, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but ahead of that, this picture here that I just love so much is so this rescript research scholarship that we've been running for the last few years. Um, it's really individualized for the person's need. So that first picture you saw of Safe Nuru in Tanzania at the time, there wasn't a certified plastic surgery training program in Tanzania. So we sent him to Uganda for the year. Uh, this is Dr. Angela Pinadeo from Mozambique. Um, she has a great trainer, local trainer, Dr. Pedro Santos in Mozambique. But he was feeling like, you know, most trainees get to learn from 10 people. Like, yes, she has me, but I'd love to give her some more exposure. So we sent her to Nepal for six months. This is our country director, Dr. Shankar Rai. Um, and then she went to Uganda for three months. And then she's actually going to finish her year in, um, she's going to Vietnam in next week, because that's one of our big programs there. So that she'll have, get to see how all those different hospitals run different techniques from all those people. And she'll go back to Mozambique with all those great new skills. Um, and then our next uh, annual scholar is Dr. Owen Muzinda from Zimbabwe, who wants to bring microsurgery um, to Zimbabwe. They do have a microscope there, but he hasn't had access to that training. So we've also sent him to Nepal. Miles probably met him. Um, to learn because they have a great microsurgery program there. We sent him to an India workshop training program um, and to another partnership organization, Cure International, also has a few great microsurgeons on the continent. Um, Dr. Andrew Hodges, who was in Uganda and now is in Zimbabwe. Um, so that is just a program that I love, like 
just making those connections for people of like, maybe there's someone in your neighboring country who has that skill and helping to support and enable that. Um, and then the last one here is the Matalasi Matanga Scholarship. She was actually uh, a young surgeon in Zambia who we'd been supporting since medical school, who tragically passed away a couple years ago. Um, and so we were able to set up a scholarship in her name to keep her legacy alive. She had this beautiful vision that she wanted to build. There's no plastic surgery program in Zambia currently. Um, there's another young surgeon who we're supporting who will be building out the residency program, but she wanted to build the first burn hospital uh, in the country. And so through our corporate sponsor, we've set up these little mini scholarships. They're $2,500 um, for any woman plastic surgery trainee in an LMIC. And they can use that money however they want. Like we have full trust in them. You know, they might need it for books. They might need it for a living cost. Um, they might need it to attend a conference. Um, so if you know any young plastic surgeons, this is open even places we don't work. Um, we really want her legacy to live on of like, maybe they're the only plastic surgeon in their hospital. Maybe there's lots um, to really just keep that like young woman's inspiration alive. Um, and then lastly, I will talk quickly about our gender equity programs. Um, so that's how one of the ways we had gotten to know Matalasi. Again, I think we all know intuitively gender equality is not only an emerative, a moral imperative, but it's also an economic one. And that's from the McKinsey Institute. Um, so when we start looking at these numbers and looking, adding in the gender lens, it just gets more and more dire. Uh, there's only three female surgeons for every 1 million people in LMICs. Uh, globally, less than one third of surgeons are female. And so we just know there's a massive opportunity here um, to ensure that women surgeons are a big part of the equation. If we have this massive surgical gap and we're only relying on 50% of the population, we're never going to close the gap. So this is our POWERS program. It's the Pioneering Women in Reconstructive Surgery. We do cohorts of six women and they go through, we give them surgical training. So we send them to a bunch of our different sites, like I was talking about, um, to learn the clinical skills. They do a year of leadership development. They get flown out to New York um, and through L'Oreal, the big makeup company, that's our corporate sponsor. They fund this leadership program that they go through. And then we also connect them to US mentors as well. So here are the classes that we've had so far. Um, a bunch of incredible, incredible women at all different stages of their career. Um, this is our current cohort who's actually just finishing. We'll be announcing our next cohort like in a month or two. Um, you'll see their U.S. mentors down there as well. And again, there's like so much benefit, like even beyond what we do or even can track. Um, some of these U.S. mentors are sponsoring these women to come out and do observerships now. And that's all just through making these connections um, and then forming relationships. Um, and so again, just looking at that ripple effect of raising up these women, they now have this great international cohort um, where they are on WhatsApp and talking every day, sharing cases, talking about issues with their hospital administrations and all the joys um, so getting that peer community directly impacting patients and then hope hopefully going on to teach future generations as well. So that was a whole lot. Um, but as we all know, all this work needs funding. And I think global surgery is just horrifically underfunded. Um, and we know from the World Bank that every dollar we invest in global surgery gives us 10 times the results. I don't need to tell this crew here. I think you all know and believe and have bought in, um, but we just see that it's such a valuable investment and it really just changes everything. As many of you know, working directly with patients on the ground, seeing that smile, seeing that hope that they are given um, is just, it's worth everything. And it's why we're all here. So I always just like to bring it back to the patient. 
And that ends my formal talk, but I did just want to put a quick plug in. I don't think anyone here, maybe you are. If you're going to be in the New York area, uh, we have an event on March 11th um, at the UN about Girls on Fire, which is about uh, some of those burn articles that Laura and I have written about, about the gendered outcomes of burn injuries and the disproportionate impact um, on women and children. And so we've got a great speaker series lined up. We're bringing out our partner, Dr. Rosalino from Uganda, who's going to be on the panel. Um, Physicians for Peace is sponsoring Natalia from Colombia. She's an acid attack survivor and patient advocate. Um, and then some great experts as well. Laura Himicki, who's on the call, will be a moderator. So it should be a great event. Um, we're really looking forward to it. And then this is my last slide, just to please, please ask, how can we partner and work together? Um, there's such a great need out there. None of us can do it alone. So let me know if you've seen anything that looks interesting. And that's it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azali. That was really, really wonderful. I've learned a lot. We've all learned a lot. This was really wonderful and inspiring, honestly. And to my own personal part, I will say, I will say on that part of how, uh, like with the work that you've been doing over the years, how it, um, like one surgeon or expert from one country is able to again help another expert in, in another, another country. I think that's really uh, wise, wise way to do it. And also it, I, I would say in a way it is, it makes their work to be easier instead of sending maybe experts every day to come, you know, I think that's really wonderful. I have to, I just want to congratulate with the wonderful yeah. work that you guys are doing. And that's a very wonderful question that you asked. <laughs> uh, at the end, uh, at the end of this, I think I will leave Irene to, uh, and, and maybe the co-chair of uh, the G4 Alliance African Working Group to answer that question. <laughs> And for now, I just want to have a few minutes for questions we see from the church. So warm welcome for the for questions. Oh, Mohammed, I see you. Welcome, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for this great presentation. Uh, my first question is: uh, uh, if there is another country, it's not in your partnership countries, it's not in your program already, and want to be a partner, is it like there is a room for that or not? And if yes, how can they approach that? Um. I would say, I mean, the easiest way at this point in time uh, is through all of our online learning and our live, uh, like our monthly lectures, if they're a surgeon or anesthesiologist, um, so that we can kind of get to know them. And then through getting to know them, then we'll often can like sponsor them to maybe come join uh, like a regional training or something like that. Um, that's kind of the best way to get to know people in the places that we're not going to regularly. Was was that okay, Mohammed? Yeah, it is it is okay. <laughs> um I'm just concerned about the 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 reconstruction after conflict because I'm con I'm from Sudan and I'm yeah. it's like yeah, I'm asking with this concern in mind and with my member organization is uh, from Sudan and as a uh, secretary of the African working group as well. Uh, we are all like having the same vision with Irene and Laura and the others like to unify the effort of all of the organization that working in Africa to support Africa global surgery in a better way. So with that in mind, I ask this because we, we might be approached by other other countries that are not like in part of your partnership and they might need, like we can like collaborate, organize something. So that's why I asked this question. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to follow up and discuss more. Um, I know even in Ethiopia, we're based in Addis right now, but a lot of the surgeons from the Tigray region and from the Northern part of the country see unfortunately a ton of conflict trauma. Um, and even actually in Uganda, we they will sometimes get patients that come from different areas with from conflict. Um, so I could see something like, you know, sponsoring that person to go 
and work in Addis for a couple of weeks or something to get some of that exposure from the great, um, the, really the great surgeons they have there so that they can go back home. Uh, I saw a question, I saw a hand from Laura Homek before Nkobi. Laura, do you, do you still want to say something? No, I want to save the time for other people. It's like, no, <laughs> not often. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, Kobe. Hi, my name is NKOB. I'm with Smile Train. So that was a great presentation. And um, I just have one question for research. And I, I, I really appreciate the fact that you are doing a lot of work in Africa. But I'm a bit biased because I'm from the Western Africa and I didn't see much of your work in the Western Africa subregion. And I wanted to know, is there, uh, is there, is that the plan or is there a future plan to come into West Africa? And just as Mohammed said, there may be need because uh, there are so many countries that are still struggling to, to get on board and they really would want to know how can they approach an organization like yours to see what they can do for them. That is the first question. And then the second question, which is a call to action. I, I really love the last slide where she posed a question. Um, global surgery is at a critical point now. Uh, there is need for us to work together to ensure that whatever initiatives that have been brought to Africa really trickles down to helping build solid health systems that are resilient. So it's it's for everyone on the call, not just for research, but it's for everyone on the call to start thinking, how can we really you know, respectfully work together for the betterment of our people, especially in Africa? Over. Thank you. I uh, will just plus one to your last statement that again, like we are, really shockingly small and our budget is incredibly small. And so, I mean, talking, getting to talk to Smile Train and Op Smile, I mean, your budgets are a hundred times larger than ours. Um, and so we really would love to partner and to complement each other's work more and more because the need is so great. Um, and then unfortunately that is the reason why we're not in West Africa. Like I actually think as our chief program officer, we're spread way too thin already being in 18 countries um, because I do think going deeper in each of those hospital partnerships and really helping to build out the full ecosystem because as we know, if the patient doesn't survive to that level to get reconstructive surgery, if you know the highest morbidity, uh, Morbidity rates are from anesthesia care. So if we're not training anesthesia, if we're not focused on nursing. We have to do all those pieces. Um, so really our biggest barrier is funding. And that's why you don't see us in West Africa, which my heart is there. I spent my 20s in Ghana and Liberia. Um, I worked on the Ebola outbreak in 2013. I would love to be there. Uh, but I think unfortunately where we're at financially, we won't be expanding to new countries anytime soon. Um, and I know the West African College of Surgeons really needs more resources. Honestly, I think even more than COSEXA, especially with the French language barrier, which I think unfortunately ends up um, like adversely punishing countries uh, just because there's so much more funding from the U.S. and um, Europe, not, not as much. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to be there. Unfortunately, I think we'll have to look to our partnership models for, for the time being. Um, I know Mercy Ships is also in West Africa. Um, and so I think looking to those who are on the ground there and with our current size, we, we are kind of digging deeper into the places where we are, even though we know the need is massive. And then I think the thing I'm most excited about is if there is a young surgeon who's in a place like um, Molly, for example, that was a general surgeon who really loved plastic surgery, had a lot of high burden. He's the only surgeon around where he works. Um, so we sent him to some of our sites to learn there so that he could go back home. And then also when he's home, like now with WhatsApp and everything, being part of that network 
So he still gets support in that sort of way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. For... Okay. Thank you for that response and Kobe. Uh, so there's a bit of question in the chat uh, from Bettel. She says, quantifying the impact of educating surgeons is great, but I also think qualitative aspect or stories is very important and insightful. Curious if there ha has been any steps to assess that? Um, I think we ha have tons of stories and that's um what we were always telling people, right? I think the Matalasi story is an unfortunate and like tragic story. And I think many of us know where we've seen um, in some of the countries we work where they don't have the plastic surgery specialty and we've invested so much in that one person um, for them to be the future in that country and then unfortunately losing her. But thankfully, there are other trainees there who are now um, another young surgeon has actually been in Japan, Dr. Chihina Banda, for the last 12 years doing his plastic surgery training, uh, microsurgery training, and just returned to Zambia. And now we're helping him to set up uh, the first residency program there. Um, so I think we do have the stories and we know that the that training is definitely the model. Like us going in a few times a year is never going to have the same impact as somebody on the ground and working with young trainees every day. Um, and we'd love to share those stories more, but, uh, for us, we, we knew that was the right way, but the quantification was the missing piece. Um, and so that's why we worked on that model. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, so everyone, thank you truly so much for joining us today. And for that last slide, I would love to leave it to, to my chair. Say mm -hmm. something, Miss Irene, please. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Please pardon me that I'm unable to put my camera on today. I'm having issues with my internet. Um, thank you very much, Natalie, for your presentation. I just sat down and listening and watching the video. Um, some I had a feeling there is a spark of fire inside me because I'm based here in Ghana, and every day when you drive through the traffic. There are thousands of children who are paraded along the streets with pictures and conditions, surgical conditions, and people are advertising, raising funds for them to get care. And um, this goes beyond even my organization, Operation Smart, because we are into cleft skin. So I see these children and I keep on asking, how can we get help for them? And this happens in a lot more countries. So I'm really excited to actually listen and learn deeper about the things that research is doing across Africa. We pray that you, your organization grows bigger and get more partnerships even with member organizations so that we are able to do more. Talking about collaboration, I think it's a great call. And I saw our secretary respond in the chat that um, this is the first presentation. Next month, we are going to have a presentation from Hill Africa, and we'll be going in tents to hear from all the other organizations. And then from there, we'll start organizing discussions. Because we, as an African working group, we just want care in Africa. We live here and we see what lack of access to care means, even to people like us who even work and earn a living. So how much damage or catastrophic expenditure will be on people who earn below $5 a day in, in our continent? Well, this is also an opportunity to start discussions. We've all listened. So if you are here, an organization, and you want to partner with Research, you can reach out to Natalie or you can reach out to me and we can have a discussion together and see how we can work together, fly each other to places where we cannot reach. And so the floor is open. Whoever wants to partner can reach out to us. I'm going to, it's, I mean, we are about four minutes past our time, but I'm going to give um, Dr. Pierre Impere, who is the coach of the African Working Group, the opportunity, just in case you have anything to say about this. Hello. Hi. You can hear me? Yes. Yes, oh, we can. Okay. Thank you. I'm so happy that you can hear me. Oh, uh, wonderful presentation, Natalie, and I thank you very much. And I think it's really very important for all of us to know 
uh, what our, part, our partner are doing in Africa. I hope that next month we will have another organization. Uh, I see my sister, Obi, uh, she's around. Maybe it can be my train and uh, next time. It's good to know. So that uh, that is my first time to hear uh, uh, or to learn about uh, what uh, uh, you are doing in Africa and uh, that's a wonderful uh, work for the uh, for the African people. Uh, of course, you are at global level, but I'm talking about Africa as we uh, our uh, subject or target is uh, for uh, African people. So. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, that is uh, my comment of the day. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you thank so you much. Very much. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you so much, everyone. This was really thank wonderful. Natalie. Thanks I, so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to hear more. Yeah, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We Laura, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely thank evening. You. Great job, Natalie. And Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Right now.